So it's 175 years, and I was moved last night, truly moved to, um, to listen to Bishop Hector Monterroso's speech uh, sermon to us and the idea of missionaries who have gone before us. And kind of the amazing moment that we stand at holding for a short while the ministry of this diocese. And I decided I'd begin by address, by echoing the address at the 100th celebration of this diocese. And Bishop John Hines stood before the diocese and he began this way. In that voice of his, which was somewhat high, yet pressing upon us. He wrote, we have toiled in God's good land. We have been met with disease, with fire, with flood and with hunger. Today at our 175th council, we continue to give thanks, not for the things that we have or the accomplishments. No, we give thanks to God for what God has done, for the glory is God's and it is not our own. It's God's power working through us that can do more than we can ask or imagine. It's it's God's grace mercy, forgiveness, power, and love that comes as a gift of the Spirit through us out into the world. For St. Paul describes, if we have not love for God, the God who has love for me, how can I have love for another person? How can I keep from just being a noisy gong? What's important there is not that it comes from me, but it comes from God and God's love for me out into the world. Faith, hope, and love are tied in a knot together, though most of the time we spend a lot of of our, our words on love. But it is faith, hope, and love together. And they come from our relationship with God first, first, and then flow outward. In faith and hope and love are based upon our human reserves. We shall be but an unenduring, clanging symbol. We have faith that God is undertaking the work of the Spirit, that things that have grown old are being made new, that God is effectually working out God's providence in all of the cosmos creation and through the people of the Diocese of Texas. We have held together. We have added faithful clergy from every side of our debates, and we have grown our college of presbyters. People said that the church in this time could not rise above the challenges of sexuality and gender. But I have seen it. Leaning on our faith in God and God's mission, we stayed together in this diocese, and that enabled us to continue to be God's hands and feet in the world. We began to reach out to help diocese and province do the same thing, to hold together in the midst of this massive fight. And for those who suffered under division, some of the siblings in this room, for those who had to deal with celebration, it was the Diocese of Texas that stepped in and funded and helped them as they had to figure out their own way. We joined with them in prayer and very real support. Today, we are even reunified with our brothers and sisters and siblings in Fort Worth. What an amazing thing that is. Now, I'll tell you, we're still working all that out, all of it, the issues of sexuality and gender and Fort Worth. (laughs) They're still not so sure about this bishop they've inherited. But you all help them with that. We have a way to go, and the conversations are not over. But (laughs) with faith, hope, and love, we can do that. Because it's not dependent upon us to solve it. 
who could have imagined at that time that God would do through us an amazing thing? People said we could not access all the resources needed for mission. And in those first years as your bishop, I began to pray. Where will we find these resources? How will we do this work? Lord, help us to find a way. People said that there was too much time and energy, too much attention being paid to a health system. And so I listened to what they had to say. And people were frustrated and they felt like nothing could be done. More than six times in our history, bishops of this diocese had tried unsuccessfully to sell the hospital and transition those assets into mission. But together, we in this diocese transitioned the asset. We built a bold vision. We leaned into greater health care for the people of Texas and the challenges of our time we release the asset into new mission and new forms of mission. And today we support through mission, through ministry of service, by means of granting dollars and expertise to clinics, to Texas, the Texas Medicaid, Medicare office, the legislator, our own service ministries across the diocese like El Buen and St. Vincent's, from our churches to the tune of $35 million a year. All total, listen to this, since we began that ministry, all total, we have given nearly $1 billion away to clinics and health care in the Diocese of Texas. And that asset is still valued at its sale price and a little above at $1.3 billion. In 2023, our influence, i just give you one example, our influence affected by working by choosing not to take a political side, but by working with the state offices. The Diocese of Texas and its partners helped to provide a Texas-wide health care initiative that was passed into law to take care of mothers and prenatal and their prenatal needs and postnatal needs to decrease maternal and child mortality. We have changed Healthcare in the state of Texas, decreasing maternal mortality. That is amazing. Who would have thought we would do that? Who could have imagined what God would do through us? And that is you all, the board and the people and the staff. In our time, when I began, clergy insurance was being paid by all of the congregation by all of you to the tune of $4 million a year. Rates were climbing, it was, it was really troublesome. And we were trying to figure out what we could do. And so we began to whittle away at benefits. We began to whittle away at taking care of our clergy families. We began to pull back in order to make the dollars work and to keep the oppressive insurance industry from taking uh, more, putting more burden on our congregations. But together, uh, we decided to reverse that trend, and we took a reoccurring gift from EHF and now created a $200 million endowment to permanently fund the insurance of clergy and families on behalf of the Diocese of Texas. What's amazing about this is that, and we may not think about it this way, but look, any church with a full-time priest is receiving close to $20,000 of underwriting by the Diocese of Texas in this fund. That is a direct bottom line gift. And in some congregations, let's say where you might have more than one clergy, we could be making an annual gift of over $100,000 to your budget. There is no diocese who is now the largest donor in its congregations, right? in the Episcopal Church, right? So that's an amazing, like it's a reverse. We actually give away to you, the congregations, more money than you share in our ministry together. For many congregations in the Diocese of Texas, we have slowed the budget pressure and that has been amazing. Who could have imagined that? We 
do not believe that we could resolve our differences and pay our full asking to the wider Episcopal Church rate, but today we have raised our giving over three times. We're paying our full assessment to the Episcopal Church and about $1.5 million, which is about the same, to the Anglican Communion, to ministries in health, theological education and formation, uh, and in mission work across the world, from China and Asia to Africa to South and Central America. Who would have thought that we would begin to become an important part of the wider communion? When Bishop Wimmerly said to us, we will be both Episcopal and Anglican, nobody could imagine what that meant. At the time, we thought it meant something about dealing with diversity. What it meant was stepping up as the Diocese of Texas and becoming partners in a global mission, not so that we could be the benefactors, but rather that through our relationships, we would gain information that's important for mission here in the Diocese of Texas. Not that we would make mission trips, but that we would make pilgrimages to be with our brothers and sisters and siblings around the world. Today, to be Episcopal and Anglican in this setting, in the Diocese of Texas, means something completely different than it used to. And I promise you, God is in the middle of that work. <laughs> Ten years ago, we saw that there was going to be a clergy shortage. Now, the Episcopal Church right now is all like, Ooh, we're in a clergy shortage. The Diocese of Texas has known that for over a decade, and we began to raise up clergy. In the last couple of years, 18 and 20 clergy have been ordained. Each year in the Diocese of Texas, we believe in calling laborers and praying for laborers with God to be sent out to grow the Diocese of Texas, to send laborers into God's harvest. And we have sent lay area missioners out to help inspire congregations. We're funding our seminaries, funding Iona, which, by the way, is training over 100 students uh, all over the Episcopal Church today, making, by the way, the Seminary of the Southwest one of the largest theological formation schools, maybe the largest formation school in the country. <laughs> Together, we're changing the face of ministry in the Episcopal Church and gaining ground looking like the people that we serve. In 2023, we financially aided seminaries in three other regions of the world, and people said that we did not have enough gifts and not enough people to start missional communities. We started over 75 in the post-COVID moment. We have 25 continuing, but you see that we are building our fellowships, growing our congregations. Uh, we have uh, our, our college campus is present, but we have over 27 campus ministries, and we hope to grow that in the 80 campuses in the Diocese of Texas in 24. There's probably one of the most important missionaries that we're supporting is exactly that, college mission. College mission, they, this is drying up all over. But here in Texas, College Mission is one of the most important ministries in this diocese, I promise you. In 2012, the Episcopal Church had planted three churches over the last decade. We could not imagine in that moment how we could do the work and where all the people would come from. People were worried. People were worried in our established churches there weren't enough people to go around. Let me say that again. There, we were worried there weren't enough Episcopalians out there for us. <laughs> Today in the diocese, we've started over 24 congregations. 24. We have 18 now, and we're looking forward to planting three new ones. One of them is going to be lay-led to uh, this next year, uh, and we're excited about welcoming... Uh, you know, it's great when fish start jumping in the boat, Jesus said. It's great to have Rez South here in Austin. Would you all stand up? They're present with us. We're excited about you all joining our mission and ministry. What a great thing to have you come to us.
You're going to make us better by being a part of our lives, just like everyone, every new person who comes into our church. We are changed with the hope and the vision of those who join us in this ministry. It enlivens us. It makes us realize that they bring to us their own spiritual journey and pilgrimage, which is a tremendous gift for us to say grace over and to be thankful to God that we get to share that with others. And now we stretch all the way from the, I get to say this, we stretch from the Gulf of Mexico to the Red River. Who would have thought we could do that? I want to say the secret map in my office has like little arrows, you know, that go out, but that's not really true. Uh, we have launched uh, in 2024 a new position. Uh, we've just finished, thanks to Bishop Brian and a formation group. I talked a little bit about this, but we've now uh, put the position up online. We're going to hire a canon formation. This person is going to be placed in the Austin office and will be hired rethinking, restructuring discipleship for a new age that will enable all of us in our congregations to do discipleship better. Uh, and we have the funds. We've created uh, an endowment to fund that position as well as the ministries that flow out of that including future theological education and we also have funded uh, more dollars for 2024 for our reunification uh, as we continue to do that work we're funding small churches and grants to stabilize buildings and improve the facilities and in the midst of great trial we set aside 13 million dollars and grants for racial justice and reconciliation. And that has begun to weave faith and hope and love across the Diocese of Texas, helping to repair the breach created many years ago. We have funding students and seminarians. At, uh, historic black colleges were funding uh, a number of students across the diocese. Churches have funded racial reconciliation training and programs in our parishes and seminary. The, the seminary programming itself is funded in part by, by this, uh, this endowment, contributions to our historic black churches to make sure that deferred maintenance is taken care of for them. This is one of the most power. I can't tell you. We got to listen. We got to listen. We're going to have to get some folks here to do this. But we, had, we got to listen to people who received those scholarships this year. It was the most touching thing. And to see, we had our first graduates, to see that the Diocese of Texas, by choosing to do something positive to help the past be healed, we were graduating and helping students find jobs. What an amazing, amazing thing. So we've taken all of that. And every Sunday as I visited your churches in 2023, I published a hope video. They're all online. But people ask me, what gives me hope? You do. <laughs> That's the point of this. You all give me hope. Every congregation, every student ministry, every missional community, every church plant. How could we not be hopeful in the Diocese of Texas? What more does God have to do to prove God's faithfulness, God's power, God's hope, and God's love in this church than this? The church is not dying. It is alive. And God's power is flowing through us. We grew. 68 of the congregations grew. 68 coming out of everybody, I don't know. 68 grew, our membership grew, our ASA, our average weekly attendance grew because of the amazing things that God is doing in the midst of us. Those are just signs, but below them are amazing narratives. Now, you all know me better than to think that I'm not thinking about the challenges yet in front of us. 2024, yeah, I can't call it, I keep wrestling with this. I've just like scratched it out a thousand times. But 2024 
is the beginning of a post-COVID event. I can't say post-COVID because there are a bunch of you that got COVID this week and aren't with us, right? So I can't really say post-COVID. I got four friends who all have COVID. So it's not post-COVID, but it, it's the beginning of living with it. It's the beginning as that disease changes, but we are coming past that event. So I began to think, what are the key pieces in what we have to understand? Because in part, we are changing. The world is changing. But what I recognize at this 175th anniversary is actually that's been true forever. We're not the first. How, how is that? That we would be so bold to think that we have it worse than anybody else. Huh? We're going to have to, so the first thing is we're going to have to have a little bit of humility and say that we are not the first generation to deal with floods and fire and disease and a lack of mission and ministry and the need for church plantings. We're not the first generation, so in some ways we have to look back and realize that God is constantly making the church new. We pray it in this ordination season, and I came to me, we've been praying it for weeks now that God, we have to believe it. We can't just say it. We have to believe that God is making the church new. And the only way to deal with our anxiety about what lies ahead of us is not to focus on the anxiety, but to focus on God's presence, love, and through faith, discover him. The reality for us, yes, the reality for us is we actually have to start being church. We bring, and here's part of the thing, we love over the years, and I've been part of it, I've been, I'm part, maybe. We have talked a lot about the culture out there. But we bring that culture in here. The economic, political, and social issues arrive in us, in our churches. The values of the culture come into our churches through us. Without reflection, we will just become a clanging symbol like everybody else. It is faith, hope, and love that makes us different. That makes us a different kind of group of people. We must recognize God's love for us. And we're going to have to go deeper into what it means to believe in a God who is acting through us. And recognize that sometimes we're not at our best together. We're just not. But in those moments we have to, as the baptismal covenant says, turn and return to the Lord to ask for forgiveness and to go deeper. Only in going deeper with Jesus Christ and our reception of forgiveness and mercy and love will we be able to accomplish anything. Only in opening ourselves up to what God's doing will we be able to do anything. So we also <laughs> have to look at some best practices. And so in 2024, we're going to evaluate where we are, how we're in uh, investing our money in mission and ministry, our time and our energy, and we will return with you uh, to you with a report. Um, I, we have goals, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time-bound goals that allow us to look and measure how we're doing, where we're going, and to adjust those. After 15 years, it's time to adjust them for the next decade of ministry together to evaluate that work, to reimagine what God's doing, to return to the faith, to ask where the hope is, to multiply that hope and love intentionally. What I will tell you is you also need to be doing that work. 
this is not just something the diocese office does. We need to do it together as congregations to take the moment in this season, in this post, this new era, to look and evaluate how we're doing and to face honestly the challenges before us. And to recognize that probably the greatest thing that we've talked the most about is evangelism and it's the one thing we're the worst at. We don't need another committee on evangelism. We don't need to like put some people together to talk about evangelism in your churches. You actually know how to do this. You'll say, I don't know, no you do. You start praying with God, asking God, who's gonna be in front of you today that you will have an opportunity to share God's grace with. That's, that's all, just, could you do that? for me could you do that with me I mean like like let's begin to ask God where is my grace going to be seen in the world today where is God going to have his hand out God's working in the world around me we prayed in our Eucharistic prayer Lord help us to see your hand at work in the world let's find God let's find the grace let's join people there let's introduce them ourselves let us tell them how amazing our church is and if your church isn't amazing, you're probably not doing it right. <laughs> Which means you need to double down on prayer and everything else I had in the first part of the address. So just, this is like I'm giving you this, the structure here. But we're going to have to do this work. You go to a congregation and say, what are we going to do? You know what we need is youth ministry. No, you need to do evangelism. The rest will figure itself out. And that's actually true. We've been trying to solve issues that are presented because of the lack of evangelism not evangelism we've tried to come up with all kinds of ways to explain God to the world God loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so is not that difficult for us right it just is pretty simple now it brings with it a lot of questions but we can handle the questions. I'm just saying, you know, we come up, we want to be relevant. No, no, no. We're the church. We need to be church. And two, yeah, that's right. I'm so sorry. They shouldn't have let me do this without slides. In 2024, we'll begin our new formation office. I've talked to you about that. And we're very excited. But it is going to take us rejecting some nostalgia about Bible school and Sunday school and all of those things to figure out how to do disciple in our congregations. And I hope that you will do that. We also need to recognize that the work that we're doing is not the same as it was 30 years ago when I began as a priest. This is a different world, people. 15 years ago, this is still different. 10 years ago, still different. This changed in amazing ways, and we have to be attentive to what's going on in our time. Now, in faith, faith, God, Christ Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, who has created the world and asks us to care for God, for, for God's creation and cosmos, faith in a very real Jesus who died on the cross and rose from the dead and who draws us with arms wide open towards God, Faith in a Holy Spirit who gives us wisdom and moves our bellies to be responsive to pain in the world that fills us up with love and sends us out to be a blessing to the world. The strength to do so will only be found in our prayer, in our worship, in our regular community gatherings. The strength to meet our challenges is not found in us but will always be found limited to how much we're willing to do God's work and allow God to move with us. Hope is discovered in the relinquishing of God's power into the world. Hope is found in a God who does not abandon us to the grave, but stays with us to the end of the ages. And love is born for the Christian, not from within, not from a feeling, but from God's vantage point of the cross looking upon us.
love begins with the very real outpouring of God's love, will we realize that no matter what our broken road and story is that brings us to this moment, no matter what sin we carry with us and shame that God has taken that up on God's cross for us. And that you and I are loved. I'm going to share your very real story and conclude with a letter. A woman wrote Bishop Hector this week. She said, it was my honor to see you again. It gave me great joy to express my gratitude for the wonderful work you do. Because of you and Father Mike's and the good people of St. Thomas the Apostle Episcopal Church, God has rescued me, she wrote, from a wasteland of bitterness and delivered me to a place where my heart is overflowing with Christ's love. His love feels profound, transformative, and all-consuming. Sometimes all I can do is be still and breathe in the loveliness. You see, she had carried with her, since she was a young woman, the pain, the anger of losing a parent to suicide. And that has been healed. And she continues to write, I want to spend the rest of my life in humble service to Jesus Christ. I'm not sure what that looks like, but that's okay. I have faith that he will show me the way and I will joyfully go anywhere he leads me. She'll actually be leading the Lenten series. The discipleship there has been so powerful that the love has been transformed into gift for others. More than all the things, all the goals, all the excitement that I have this week, when that letter came in, one person's life changed. I thought, 15 years is worth it. One. Isn't that the story of the gospel? That God goes after the one while we're not even paying attention. We're just left. <laughs> and God brings us one. What an amazing gift. What story of transformation and faith and hope and love do you have, I wonder? Where God changed your life. You're here in this room for a reason, and it's not parliamentary procedure. <laughs> You're here because God has moved in you and for you, and you've discovered God's love. And there's a story that resides inside you. Some of you have heard this before. Fifteen years ago, I want to share it with all of you. Fifteen years ago, I wrote a letter in my first year to myself. Like young Andy wrote a letter to old Andy. Uh, I couldn't open it till November of this year on the anniversary of my Episcopal ordination. So I opened it, and I thought, oh boy, this is going to be great. I'm going to see a long list of accomplishments that I was supposed to undertake. I'm going to feel so good about myself. But no, old Andy was wiser than young, uh, uh, young Andy was wiser than old Andy is sometimes. So I opened it, and within it were not uh, the organizational hopes that young Andy had, but instead young Andy wrote to old Andy and said this, four things. Remember that you are part of a leadership generation that even now is passing away. 
So be responsible for raising up and handing on to the next generation of leadership the future of the church. The second thing was this. I hope that you're having fun as much as you are now. Yes, young Andy, I am. Thank you very much. I hope you love the work as much as you do now. And I hope you love the people as much as you do now. Young Andy was a little off. I don't think he could imagine how much fun with you. I don't think young Andy understood how much I would come to love being with you. And I don't think Andy then could imagine at that point how much he could love you. It is a pleasure to serve you. And I'm looking forward to our next decade together, which will come to an end sometime. But we have work to do. <laughs> and it's so much fun. It's filled with so much love. And I wouldn't, I would not dare to dream of doing this work with anybody else. So thank you.